Welcome to the Business of Story podcast, where the world's best storytellers from business, Hollywood, and beyond teach you how to use stories to communicate and connect with your customers. The Business of Story is sponsored by ACT, the best-selling customer management software for small business, and by Zignal Labs, the real-time cross-media story tracking platform. Here's your host, Park Howell from Park & Co., and today's special Business of Story guest. Welcome to the Business of Story, where we explore the intersection of creative storytelling and commerce. And by commerce, I mean everything from business leadership to brand strategy and activation to content marketing. Hi, I'm Park Howell, and my job is to ignite your inner storyteller by introducing you to some of the most amazing story artists in the business. And today is absolutely no different. Now, this guy, I got to know... Uh, through his second book, Connection, and we'll talk about that. But what's amazing to me about him is he is a Harvard PhD oceanographer. He gave up a tenured position to then go out to USC Film School where he graduated, presumably with honors. Once you get to know this guy, you'll see what I mean. He became a documentarian, and he's just about ready to publish his third book. I would love to welcome to our show, and a great honor of having him here, Randy Olson. Great to be here and great to talk to you once again, Park, because we've had lots of lengthy, incredibly productive conversations over the past few years. <laughs> you know what? And again, you know, God bless technology. I guess we have never actually met in person. We were scheduled to do that about a year ago, and then this back thingy took me over, and I haven't been out there, so we got to rectify that here in September, October. We'll be out there. But um, I first came across you at the intersection of storytelling and business, and book, I think, actually, I read a precursor to your book before it came out called Connection, Hollywood Storytelling Meets Critical Thinking. And out of that, I just pulled so many great nuggets on how to work with our students to help train them. Tell us a little bit how you went from oceanographer to documentarian to now author, training scientists literally around the world how to communicate. I will tell you that in one sentence using the be all and end all of communication that you and I are going to talk about in great depth known as the ABT. Uh, and my story is that I was a marine biologist and I received tenure at the University of New Hampshire, but then I realized I had a bigger, broader interest in the mass communication of information. I resigned from my tenure professorship, moved to LA, went to film school and ended up writing three books, of which the third one is coming out in September, titled Houston, We Have a Narrative, Why Science Needs Story, to be published by University of Chicago Press. Right on, right on. And so what is it about you and scientists and their lack of ability to be able to communicate and connect with the rest of the world? Why did that get you know in your craw and you want to do something about it? We have to say here in this session and uh, that we'll be discussing in, in, at the core of my book or the, the training that I do nowadays all comes down to this one singular template that we have labeled as the ABT, which stands for these three words, and, but, and, therefore, and I am arguing nowadays it is the be-all and end-all of communication. There is no alternative version to this for narrative, and narrative is at the core of how we've communicated for at least 4,000 years. And the time has come for everybody on the planet to learn this fundamental building block of how to communicate, the ABT. And you won't see it so far in much of anything anybody else is, is teaching, with the exception of the two brilliant guys who created the animated series South Park, Trey Parker and Matt Stone. They are the two that I learned about it from. And they talked about it in terms of a rule they called their rule of replacing that they use in editing where they replace ands with buts and therefores. I've, I heard that three and a half years ago. I've now had this long journey of developing it, crafting it. And you, sir, are the one who labeled it as, quote, the DNA of story, which I quote you on in my book. And you're absolutely right. And nowadays it is the magic bullet that we're using with everybody that I work with now the ABT. And so that's at the core of it all. And what the ABT is, is the essence of narrative. The problem the science world has is that is a, it has a very strong non-narrative tendency. And they just don't have enough awareness of this problem that they have, the way in which they are drawn over and over again to be non-narrative. Uh, and yet, 
part of the argument I make in the book is that a hundred years ago, it wasn't that way. Scientists a century ago were more narrative than they are today, I believe. And one of the kind of reflections of that is that a century ago, they actually created a, a narrative template for all of their communication, their written communication, which persists to today. It's almost universally used today. And yet they're completely oblivious of it. So there's a name for this template which is the IMRAD, I-M-R-A-D, and I, in preparation for writing this book, began in my talks to hundreds, thousands of scientists asking the audience, how many people know what this acronym means, I-M-R-A-D? Last fall, I did it with 1,000 or 800 um, uh, agronomists, kind of uh, plant biologists, and not a single hand went up out of 800 of them. And then the next question is, how many of you have ever read a scientific paper broken into four sections, introductions, methods, results, and discussion. Um, the, those are the five letters with A standing for and. And by about the time I get to the word R for results, they all start laughing like, oh my God, you guys, because they've all read hundreds, if not thousands of papers with this structure, and yet they've all forgotten where it came from, which was that 100 years ago, scientists were, had deeper narrative instinct. They understood the need to shape their information to conform with the narrative world in which you, we live, and they created this template that now is used everywhere, but they've collectively forgotten where it came from. And the result is that you get scientists today who are kind of nurtured in these laboratories where they don't interact, interact with the public much. Very little priority is placed on communicating effectively. And they get out there and they talk in a narrative form, which I've labeled as AAA, you're just out there. And here's a graph of this, mm -hmm. and here's a graph of this, and here's a point about this. Um, and it's very common in science, and yet it also happens in all sorts of other professions as well. Oh, we see it in business all the time. The MBAs, engineers, the intellects, lawyers, and you're right, it's just and, and, and. So tell us, what is the structure of the ABT, and how does it work, or why does it work? Yeah, well, and, you know, furthermore, in your world, it's the quant jocks, as I learned a year ago when we did our workshop with um, the folks at Deloitte, and about half of the people in that group were quant jocks, these guys who exactly, they're, you know, they're the accountants, live their world in the numbers, and you could see it with them. They're just like scientists, and they're in that and, and, and world. So what the ABT is, um, where this all began, as I say, was watching this documentary on Comedy Central they did in the fall of 2011 about the making of South Park. And halfway through, they walk in on Trey Parker, one of the two co-creators, who said that he writes the first draft of every episode, and he said, when I get it done, it's about 40 pages long, and then I go back and I use what I call my rule of replacing. And what I do is try and replace the word and with either but or therefore. Or every time you can replace an and with a but or therefore, the storytelling gets more interesting. I heard that, had I'd been through film school, I'd been through at least five to seven different writing classes. I had never heard narrative structure expressed that simply. I wrote it down and they all said, wow, you know, that's really simple <laughs> and it's correct. You know, it's true. I've just never heard it put that simply. Um, and it's not surprising that it would come from those two guys because by that point, they had had 15 years of cranking out stories week after week that had to work, won all these awards. So they have the deep narrative instinct that most human beings lack. Uh, they know a story when they hear it. And so I began researching it and immediately found my way into what's known as the dialectic, the Hegelian triad that comes from Hegel, the philosopher, and Kant in the 1700s. And what they formalized is this three-part structure that they identified as thesis, antithesis, synthesis. That is at the core of everything. It's at the core of storytelling, the core of the scientific method, the core of logic, of reason, of argumentation. You see it everywhere when you begin to get sensitized to it. Why it's not today, maybe it's too old-fashioned, but it also tracks back further than that, all the way back to Aristotle, who in the poetics was the first one to really formally talk about sure plays, having these three parts, basically, and it came to be known as three-act structure. So it's universal, it is incredibly simple, and what it means specifically with those three words is that every story, if it's a well-told story, can be broken down into that. And I can tell you the story of a little girl who lives on a farm in Kansas and her life is boring, but then one day a tornado sweeps her to the land of Oz. Therefore, she has to undertake a journey to find her way home. Or in the science world, I could tell you about 
my laboratory where we study biochemistry and physiology, but we've come to realize the important questions are at the molecular level. Therefore, we're doing the following molecular projects. Um, mm -hmm. You begin to realize it, it is applicable for every single thing. And anybody who tries to argue back and says, well, my thing's too complicated to boil it down to an ABT, that's where they're making a mistake. You know, they've failed to find the central narrative of what they're doing, and it means they're caught up in the weeds of just a big mess. Um, so I began to formulate it like that, began presenting at these science meetings, and it began taking off like wildfire, and people everywhere we go, people put it to work, and it solves all these communication problems. Isn't that what you found with your uh, courses there at Arizona State? Oh, and the irony of all this is it goes from, as you pointed out, Aristotle to Kant, and yet it took Cartman to bring it to your attention. I mean, that's, exactly. <laughs> that's how universal it is, and I found it. And absolutely, after reading Connection, teaching our folks the ABT, they look at me cross-eyed with it, and they think it, that's too simple. And it's really not because you get complete narrative story structure just by using those three words. You know, I use it in my line of work. I, then they'll you know, look at me and say, "How did you? You know, how do you use it?" And I can say, "Well." I've been in the advertising marketing business for 30 years, and we've had you know our share of successes and some mediocre failures, and uh, you know we move on. But technology has changed with the power in the consumer. Brands no longer have the influence of mass media because the masses are the media. Therefore, we have gone back to the ancient power of storytelling to bring structure and meaning to our narratives to help our brands connect on a very meaningful, basal way with our customers. That's how we use the and, but therefore something happens, conflict arises, and then you have resolution in the there moves the story on. Of course, uh, I'm sure you'll mention, talk about, Randy, how you use this over and over again. So and, but therefore, and, but therefore. Every scene has an and, but therefore in it, and you can play it into PowerPoint, you can do it in strategy and user um, experience on websites. It's really amazing how universal this is and that's when I had my aha moment and I sent you that note and I said, dude, this ABT is the absolute DNA of story. Everything starts from that ABT I found. You're absolutely right about that and as I say, I've been on a three and a half year journey where I was skeptical in the beginning. And month by month, I've gotten deeper and deeper into it. I did a TED Med talk on it a year and a half ago. I had a letter in Science Magazine um, in 2013. And slowly spreading this thing, it's incredible how resistant the science world is to innovation. Uh, you know, they're all trained to negate everything that they get confronted with. So it's very hard to affect change there. I've actually had more success in the business world with some of the groups that I work with. And they, they're more open to, to change and innovation. They're looking for new ways to do things. So it's very exciting with the business folks when pick up on it. Um, but it is that fundamental. And furthermore, um, it bugs me a little bit when people call it an acronym because um, there's more to it than just three letters because it, there's, they aren't just any three random terms. Uh, most of these acronyms, and when you start looking at all these people, the people trying to teach story now, and everybody has jumped on this bandwagon, the powers of story, the secret of story, how story will change your life. Uh, not a goddamn one of them is using the ABT yet. And until I start seeing this popping up in their language, I'm just not really a fan of what they're teaching. They're overcomplicating things. Mm -hmm. uh, story is, is endlessly challenging and, and elusive. It takes entire lifetimes. Uh, two months ago, I had a little chat with um, uh, Eric Roth, who's the Oscar-winning screenwriter that wrote the screenplay for Forrest Gump and in Munich and a bunch of other great movies, and he's 70, and I asked him, you know, at age 70, do you feel like you've got it for narrative? You know, you figured out the principles, and all you do is apply them nowadays. And he sort of said, are you kidding? You know, with every screenplay, he's learning yet a new aspect of how story works. And it's a moving target because our, our society is changing while you're figuring out how to learn narrative, and people's attention spans are changing. And so it's not the same that it was 30 or 40 years ago. It's yeah. infinitely changing which is one of my things that I'm throwing at the science world now. I'm, I'm seeing these people running these one-day workshops on the, and the secrets of story you can learn in one day. You cannot learn nothing in one day about story, <laughs> absolutely nothing. You know, and what I say is you can no more go to the gym and lift weights for a day and walk home buff than you can take a one-day storytelling workshop and become a master yeah. storyteller. Um, you can get a start. It can pick your interests. You can learn some directions. 
But narrative is like a muscle that you must work out over time, which is why what we've developed along with my book is something called Story Circles. And it's the idea of 10 weeks, one hour a week of a of sort of fits one hour training session. Randy, let's talk about your Story Circles workshop right after this message. Are you keeping track of sales leads in a spreadsheet or worse, post-it notes all over your desk? Well, there's a better way and it doesn't involve spending a fortune on complex CRM software. For over 25 years, ACT has been the number one best-selling contact and customer management software. It's super affordable and easy to use. ACT helps individuals, small businesses, and sales teams organize prospect and customer details in just one place. It also helps you market products and services more effectively, and most importantly, it drives sales. Try ACT for 30 days by visiting actstory.com and sign up for a chance to win a pair of Bose QuietComfort 20i acoustic noise-canceling headphones, a $299 value. Again, that's actstory.com. Welcome back to the business of story and our guest today, Randy Olson. Randy, you were talking about story circles. Tell us about what you're doing with that. Yeah, I, I kind of picked it up from the improv folks. I, I've, for the last 15 years, worked with um, improv actors from the Groundlings Improv Comedy Theater in Hollywood, and they do workshops with me. In fact, my co-author, Brian Palermo, from uh, my book Connection, is a longtime Groundlings member. And they talk about improv as being like a muscle that you have to work it out, you know, week after week. Brian's in this uh, weekly show on Wednesday nights called the Uncle Joe Show that he's in every Wednesday for 11 years. Um, that's what the good improv actors have to do. They have to state basically just like physical fitness and narrative is exactly the same thing. Narrative is not a few simple rules that you learn and suddenly you're, you're gifted with it. It's an instinct. Um, Robert McKee and the great screenwriting instructors in Hollywood talk about story sets. And that's this instinct that some people have got where they can hear a story. They can figure out how to fix it. When they tell stories, their stories come together really well structured and the true geniuses of it. Um, you know, like the, the show Breaking Bad was like the ultimate manifestation of how powerful and important um, narrative structure is. That's a show that was created by just a small group of writers, like three or four, with a very clear vision. And they wrote episodes two years in advance. So they were planting things that were going to come up a couple years down the line. Um, very sophisticated, but that's how challenging story can be. And to hear people talk as though um, they took a one-day workshop and they've got it all done and down and they've got what I get from a lot of these science folks now, just kind of shocking to me. So what Story Circles is then is the idea of inst if you've only got 10 hours to allocate to learning narrative, rather than doing a one-day 10-hour workshop where you walk home with your brain full of all this great stuff that you learn, um, I advocate spreading those 10 hours over 10 weeks, doing one hour a week and not doing much, just working with this ABT tool because the ABT is the be-all and end-all. Uh, you know, another way I like to refer to it is always be telling stories and that's what you want to do is always be arcing, always addressing problems and searching for solutions for them. And that becomes a piece of instinct and an intuition you have to develop so that you know, you can feel that you're droning on and on. You can feel you're off an and, and, and land and like, Oh my God, I've said too many ands. I'd better get to a point here. Um, or you can feel that you've got five different narrative threads going that other place that goes wrong. I've labeled as DHY stands for despite however yet. And that's over narrative where, you know, despite this, however, this, yet this, but this. And you hear that a lot from academics. When they get together, they can end up, you know, two colleagues working on the same topic on five different narrative threads at once, and they can follow everything. But, you know, beyond their tiny circle, he has any idea what they're talking about. So yeah. these are the what challenges can, they face. Randy, what can a business communicator do every day just to sh sharpen that storytelling muscle? That's what, that's the whole idea of our story circles um, workshop is, you know, two or three things. First off, the fundamental tool is the ABT. And the more you get to know it, the more you get, begin to spot it all around you. And that's mm -hmm. when you're starting to develop some narrative sense. When you begin to realize somebody is stuck in and, and, and mode, or you hear something that's crystal clear and you realize, wow, they just landed on the butt and they got right to the, therefore um, you begin to see it and feel it. That's the number one. The number two thing that is a, core principle out of every now is that story development has to be a social function. Story circles is built around the idea of five individuals coming together for one hour a week 
and working the first half hour, they analyze five abstracts for narrative structure, uh, for which three of them are synopses of, of movies, of, of fiction movies. And they begin to realize uh, our little catchphrase, my catchphrase in the book is, dude, it's all the same story. That came from my colleague, Dory Barton, who always said it's the truth. It's all the same story, the same structure that underlies this scientific communication also underlies movies. Uh, and then the second half hour, they take turns each week, and then they use the tools that I develop, have developed in the workshop to analyze um, their story. So that's that's what they can do is, you know, begin to organize yourselves and, and begin by reading my book. I hate to be <laughs> pimping my book, but in it, I, I conclude by describing what story circles. You know, they'll be better if you hire me to come and do it. But if you don't have the bucks or just want to get to it, just read the book and see what it says and start doing it yourself. The ABT is the be all and end all. When we come back, I'm going to introduce this. It's something you just sent me. I want you to hear this. You can guess what that is. But when we come back, Randy's going to share with us this fun little game tool he's put together to help us all become better storytellers right after this message. Your customers, employees, marketing campaigns, partners, and yes, your detractors. They're each telling a story right now about you. Where? On social media, in traditional print publications, in blog posts, on television. Basically everywhere. And it's happening 24-7, in real time. Your mission? Track these stories and the sources that share them. Smartly manage them. Analyze them rapidly and discern what you should do next, what you should do now. No wonder you're tired. Well, Zigna Labs is a real-time cross-media story tracking platform that makes your life easier. Their solution enables customers to quickly spot trends, see relevant stories unfold, and take action. So stay ahead of what the world thinks with Zigna Labs. Learn more and sign up for a free demo at zignalabs.com forward slash story. Welcome back to the business of story and my guest today, Randy Olson, and the brand new tool he's created. Here it is. Listen. You know what that is? Randy, what is it? Tell our tell our listener. Those are the ABT dice. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know what I'm looking at. He's created these dice. There's three of them. There's a green one, and on it it has words that says vector, spore, infection, <laughs> Smuts, rots, I love it. And then there's two white ones. One white one has your shoes, sports, weather, your car, platypus. The other one, ah, this is where the story structure comes in. He's got AAA, which presumably is and, 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 the ABT, the DHY, which he mentioned, and so forth. So you've got three options there. How do you play this crazy game? So this is all built around the core tool that we use for the Story Circles Workshop, which I've labeled as the narrative spectrum. And this is the idea that ABT is in the center of the spectrum. It is perfect, optimal narrative structure. It's setting up one narrative, dragging it off in a, um, in a narrative uh, pathway. And to the left is the first way that things go wrong, which is the and, and, and. And that means that that's non-narrative. You never even start a story. You never got to the but. You're just like, and we did this, and we did this, and, and finally the audience like, okay, you know, but did anything ever happen? Um, and then the other way you go wrong, the other end of the spectrum is what I've labeled as DHY. And the word but is a contradiction word. And so each time you introduce a contradiction word, you've started a new narrative direction, and people get caught up with too many narrative directions. So DHY st stands for despite, however, yet. And this means, you know, despite this happening, however this happened, yet some people think this, but you can, and that's where you get just confusing. Well, where are we going with this thing? We're off in five different directions. Both of these problems you hear all the time, boring and confusing. The goal of all of this stuff is to make people interesting, no longer boring or confusing. And this dice ends up being a tool that you can use to practice this, to, to try and rid yourself of it. So this just came to me a couple months ago, actually before we even ran our prototypes of story circles. We're kicking ourselves now, wishing we'd had this at the beginning, because it, <clears throat> it's such a simple tool. So you use two of the dice, the, the, the structure die, we call it, with the three different forms of the sentence, and then either of these two content die. So 
the white one, the two white ones you got. Roll that and um, actually do it for us. Um, okay, so I'm going to roll, roll just the white ones. I feel like I need a beer in my hand or something. Is this a drinking game? <laughs> it's a party game. Here we go. So I got a DHY in my favorite movie. Okay, so, so start with the name of the movie and take it from there. I got to add the DHY. I got to add the despite however yet. That's right. Is that right? So it's by far my favorite movie. Despite watching lots of other movies and Jaws and Star Wars and all that, however, I do really like comedies, and it's not particularly a comedy, yet my background in music brings me back to watching Amadeus. Therefore, it has become one well, of wait, 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 wait. What, Where in the world are you going with this? <laughs> That's what you get with the DHY, is your audience thinking, where, where are we yeah. going? It drains your brain a little bit to even come up with that sort of nonsense of DHY. Okay, roll again. Roll again. Okay, here we go. This is awesome. I've got the weather, and i got another dang DHY. All right, roll, roll that one again. Get us a different different structure. All right, i got an AAA. All there right, there you go. Weather. Man, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and it's summer, and it's hot as hell. It's 103 out, and we got a swimming pool like like so many other people do. So I spent a lot of time at night in the swimming pool trying to cool off. And wait, I'm wait, wait. You just broke the rules by saying so. You, uh, so is the same. So is the consequence where you're just like, therefore. So you, you uh, suddenly jumped out of that mode. But, you okay. know, so long as you're going with the ands, you, you can see how easy it is. And it's hot. And people are complaining. And people are sweating. And is our default mode for all this stuff. And this is what happens with academics, with, with particular. You ask them, what do you work on? They jump right into and mode. Well, I work on this and this and this and this and this, and you're like, why do you even bother? Yeah. Uh, now, go ahead and just roll the content die and do an ABT on what you get for that. All right. So my content, well, let's jump in here. Sports, you know, uh, sports. Growing up, I used to love to play baseball, and I was a pretty good center fielder. But then everybody grew up, and my puberty didn't hit till like four years later, and I was slow in plotting. Therefore, I never played any more baseball and moved on to skiing and other things. And that's a perfectly clear narrative thought, nice and clean and simple. We followed you all the way along. And that's, you know, the more you work with these dice, you begin to develop the instinct like, oh, my God, you know, and, and, and is just boring. DHY is a confusing mess, and ABTs are so clear, and that's yeah. what you want. So. They are a very good starting point for just getting this down. Now, the crazy thing that we're doing this Friday, actually, I sent you one of the sample kits. On Friday, I will be working with 100 plant pathologists from the U.S. Department of Agriculture at their convention in uh, Pasadena. And I'll start the morning with them. We're handing out 100 of these kits to them so they get their own little set of dice. Mm -hmm. And then they've come up with their own separate content die for, from their world, which is the green one you see there. And they pick six different diseases six different terms from their world of plant pathology. So after they use the white dye and just get used to the general topics, <laughs> then they'll move on to the green one and they'll start coming up with ABTs and, 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 and for rot, smut, what is an infection yeah, vector, right. all these different things from yeah. their world. And that's the sort of stuff we'll, we'll start doing now with, um, with groups where you have the individual group pull out their terminology, their world, what are the, what are the kinds of stories that they tell and, and this is actually, you know, we're just making this up as we go along, but I'm beginning to think this could also be a, an effective tool for somebody getting ready to give a talk where they're going to have to have a Q&A at the end of it, like a press conference. Um, you know, put your six topics on a die and practice this to make sure that you've got your ABTs ready to answer um, questions you're going to get hit with so you don't go off into and, and, and mode or to DHY. You know, Randy, you and I have been laughing when looking at, uh, when I first learned about the ABT through your book, then I started <laughs> digging through things and sure enough came across the Gettysburg Address. And the way I came across it, actually, our creative director was making a presentation and he was talking about story and he said, you know, what makes the Gettysburg Address so powerful is how it begins, four score and seven years ago, which is just another way of saying once upon a time. So, you know, story was huge, and I went and I looked at that, and I started reading through it and seeing what else was in this two-minute speech, and literally your ABT form uh, just popped out at me, and that was my aha moment, and then I you know, typed over to you and said, dude, I guess I can call you dude, do you realize that Gettysburg Address is an ABT? And um, what I encourage our listeners to do is to go and read it and see if you, 
you can't find within it the and button therefore and it is just universal natural story structure so I, you know you're really onto something with this ABT now tell us about your book your new book well, let me say one more word about the Gettysburg Address because I think it was just last year Ken Burns did an entire documentary special on the Gettysburg Address. He didn't come anywhere close to landing on. The reason that's, that speech has persisted is because it has perfect narrative structure as <laughs> exemplified by the ABT. And why these scholars have never looked at it from that perspective, I'll tell you why. Because this narrative theory has been developed here in Hollywood in the incubator of our society for narrative. And Hollywood has not meshed that well with the rest of society. Academia looks down on them like they're a bunch of morons, but they know so much more about how narrative works. And these books that, you know, and you could track the kind of the pathway, starting with Joseph Campbell, who, um, you yeah, Jonah Saxon, who, who did a nice job talking about the implementation of, of Joseph Campbell into uh, movies and storytelling. And from Joseph Campbell, then to George, uh, or sorry, to, to um, George Lucas with uh, Star Wars, where he implemented Campbell's principles of the hero's journey into that. And then Christopher Vogler and his book, The Writer's Journey, which was basically explaining to the writing audience, this is how it works. This is how George Lucas used Campbell. And then all the way to Blake Snyder, Snyder with Save the Cat, which is a dangerously simplistic version of these templates of the hero's journey. But you can see the pathway there, and that's the, w the way in which Hollywood is way out ahead of the rest of our society on these narrative principles. And what I am doing with my book here is drawing on that knowledge, trying to bring it to the science world and say, look, you guys, I know you despise these lunatics in Hollywood. I've been living here for 20 years. Trust me, you're right. They are a bunch of lunatics. But <laughs> in all of their lunacy, they've pulled out some, basically the science of narrative. They have distilled it down to that where they know these templates and formulas and the ABT being the ultimate one. And by the way, the reason the ABT is so powerful is, is one key thing, which is simplicity. And that is the essence of effective teaching and learning and all this stuff. And the problems with all these people out there trying to teach story right now is they're all overcomplicating it. And they're all jumping all the way into the complexity of the hero's journey and all this stuff for which beginning students can't take much of from that. But the ABT is transformative that they can put to work within the one day of the workshop and get a start on it. It's just that they then need to set themselves on a journey of using it week after week to begin to develop the instincts on, on how it applies to, to everything. Yeah. Yeah. And what I learned from your work in connection that in applying the ABT with our executive master's program, that's the first thing I focus on the very first week is as they start writing their own personal narrative as to why they're in this program and what sort of sustainability initiative do they want to do, they have to to start with that declarative ABT sentence and it can only be one or two sentences long it can't be going on and on so I, I get them to really boil it down but once they see it there's something about the subconscious that just wraps its mind around this ABT and it's a natural structure that it's looking for because our brain nerds has really one purpose in the world and that's to make meaning out of everything that's going on around us and there's just something about this ABT that's so biologically connected to our subconscious that our brain automatically recognizes it. And then from there... Actually, I, I would broaden out what you just said there, which is beyond making meaning, our brains are molded to one simple process, which is problem solution. And mm -hmm. from the very beginning, the first cave people walking out of the caves, they had a problem finding food and they had to solve it. That's what our brains are molded around. And one of the cool pieces of evidence that I bring up in the book is what's going on with neurophysiologists now. And I've got to be buddies with a guy named Yuri Hassan at Princeton. In February, I spent two hours hanging out with him in his lab. And he has been using functional MRI to look at brain activity of people who are being told a story that has narrative structure versus people hearing a story that doesn't have narrative structure. And you see very clear differences. First off, you see way more brain activity when people are engaged in the story. So they can mm -hmm. actually show you the science of that. But secondly, you see much greater similar similarity of activity patterns between individuals when they're caught into a narrative than when there's no narrative going on. What that means mm -hmm. is if you're up there presenting stuff and you don't have narrative structure, people's brains are wandering all over the place and they're picking up on different things. So that's sort of the leadership element of narrative, that it, it brings the whole audience together. He's developing the science to show you that. And one of the really cool things that he, he showed me, uh, he wasn't aware of the ABT and I was explaining that to him. And at one point he began showing me some work they're doing where they're having people listen to stories from NPR's radio lab 
and they look at the brain activity, and lo and behold, you can see a story being set up in the and and mode, the exposition, and's an agreement word, there's no conflict going on yet, the brain's not doing much, and on the word but, parts of the brain light up. That's the contradiction word, the, so <laughs> the center of a good story is the source of tension or conflict. So as soon as you hit that point of conflict, you, you jump into that narrative world, that's yeah. when everybody comes together, begins to focus. And this is how simple it really is at the core, and that's where everybody needs to start learning about the power of narrative. And, but, therefore. Final question for you, Randy. How is your new book, Houston, We Have a Narrative, different than Connection? Um, the new book is putting the tools I developed. So this is um, my three books can actually be broken into the, the whole thing. The first one, Don't Be Such a Scientist, was a statement of the problems with scientists communicating. The second one was the workshop. So it was the journey trying to find. I ended the first book by saying, I think the solutions to these communications problems lie in the world of narrative. I don't know enough yet to give you the specific tools to do it. Mm -hmm. Five years, then we ran this workshop, and that's where we developed these tools, the word, the sentence, the paragraph, how to distill your story down. And now with this book, I have, because I know the science world best, I have applied it now to the science world with the argument that this is, you know, the, the source of the communication problem is narrative structure. But the thing is that the, what's in the book there is really applicable to Eddie. Uh, as with all of this stuff, and communication is just universal. Mm -hmm. There is no science communication. I, I try and tell these people that. It's just communication. It's all the yeah. same. Dude, it's all the same story. It all tracks back to Joseph Campbell. He's the guy who pinpointed the monomyth, the idea that all around the world, everybody's telling stories with the same basic structure. And the last thing I want to say is I did not intend to become an ABT zealot. You are partly responsible for it. You're the guy that pointed to the Gettysburg Address, called it the DNA of story. And with each one of those little developments, you made me more rabid about it. And now you have to deal with this lunatic out there that you're, yeah. you were part of the driving force of it. So I just want to make sure you're aware of that. Well, that's good. And as, as you are elevating this discussion, I am devolving it into um, what would a caveman say about the and button, therefore? And we've got it down to three utterances. Uh huh. That's right. Yes. Tell us about uh -oh. that. Uh oh. Uh huh. There you have the ABT. Uh huh. Uh oh. Uh huh. <laughs> and, and I mean that's more than just silly. That is absolutely true. Go, go through those three again. <laughs> uh huh. Uh oh. Uh huh. And, and so the that? ABT, the three words, <laughs> and is a word of agreement, uh -huh. but is a word of contradiction. Therefore, uh -oh. is a consequence word. And so those three utterances are what's the first one? Uh huh. Uh-huh. That's Conflict. that's an utterance of agreement. What's the sac second one? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> we have a problem here. And the third one is what? Aha. Uh -huh. Aha, uh -huh, therefore. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, well, and you yeah. came up with that too. It's it's amazing. <laughs> you have pushed this whole agenda further with your input. <laughs> I've been having fun with it, man. And I really want to thank you for joining us today on Business of Story, Randy. It's, it's been a pleasure having you here. I can't wait to read the new book, and it's out, I guess, as as we speak. It just just launched. Uh, that sounds cool. And hopefully our little two-minute animated piece on the ABT is posted as well. So watch for that. Right on. Will do. And uh, thank you all for listening to this edition of Business of Story. If you like what you hear, certainly go to iTunes. We would love a rating. We would love a review. If there are more types of topics or things I can cover, please send me an email over at businessofstory.com. You can listen to this episode and you can listen to all the episodes of Business of Story there. Plus, we have some free downloadable storytelling tools on the site. So help yourself. Um, start with ABT right after we hang up with you here and become that powerful storyteller that's within. Thank you very and much. And I just want to tell your listeners that Park Howell is a guy who gets it when it comes to story far more than anybody else I've run into in the business world. So there you go. Uh, thank you, Randy. I appreciate that. Have a great day. Thanks for tuning in to The Business of Story. Don't forget there are terrific free storytelling resources for you at thebusinessofstory.com, where you'll also find the complete show archive. The Business of Story is sponsored by Park & Co., Zignal Labs, and ACT, and is produced by Convince & Convert Media. Find more great shows like The Business of Story at marketingpodcasts.com, the first search engine for marketing podcasts.